Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'm Councilman Rory Lantzman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and today <clears throat> we are here to discuss the hidden costs of our justice system and how they impact outcomes, reentry, and successful reintegration for indigent criminal defendants. The collateral consequences of a criminal conviction for even a minor crime have become well known. When an individual tries to re-enter society, they might have difficulty getting a job, be excluded from housing, lose custody of their children or access to education and student loans, or even face deportation. But less well known are the monetary costs that the justice system itself imposes on people. The court system levies a mandatory surcharge on every conviction or guilty plea to cover court costs, along with fees for crime victim assistance and DNA database upkeep. Fines are imposed as a sentence, either in addition to or instead of jail time, and are added on top of court surcharges. The minimum is $25 for minor offenses, but the maximum can be many thousands of dollars. Penalties and assessments are paid to outside agencies or organizations, like the Department of Motor Vehicles, which charges $750 over three years for any DWI offense or for determining, determining eligibility into a program. Lastly, restitution to victims can be mandated by the court based on the facts of the case up to $10,000 for a misdemeanor or $15,000 for a felony with an additional 5% surcharge going to the court system. This is not a problem just hitting those convicted of serious offenses. A violation, which is not even a crime, costs a defendant at least $120 in court surcharges and fees before even calculating in a fine for the actual charge. The starting point for a misdemeanor is $250, including a DNA database fee even if the defendant's DNA is already on file. <clears throat> and these are just the baseline amounts for parole or conditional release, release, add another $50 per month to reinstate a suspended driver's license, add $100 for work release, add a $10 a day reporting fee, on and on and on. Even programs offered as alternatives to incarceration or treatment mandated by the courts can come with onerous fees, putting them in reach for only some. For any person, these costs would start to add up quickly, but for those struggling to get back on their feet after an arrest or time in jail, these debts can cut them off at the knees. Last year, 2017, <coughs> there were over 452,000 different fines, surcharges, restitutions, or various fees charged in New York City criminal cases totaling almost $100 million. But it doesn't even end there. If someone doesn't pay, it opens up a whole new world of collections. Over 103,000 civil judgments were ordered for non-payment in 2017. Such judgments come with a 9% interest rate and can lead to damaged credit, suspension of a driver's license, garnishment of wages, seizure of a car or other property, or revocation of a business permit. Parole can even be denied, revoked, or extended just for non-payment. For those trying to reintegrate into society, court fines and fees can bar their way. And even that is better than those who have warrants issued against them, over 11,000 last year, or are committed for non-payment. In 2017, 161 people, more than half of them from my home borough of Queens, were committed to custody in what might as well be a modern-day debtor's prison. It is not enough to decry the high cost of injustice of justice for those who can least afford it, and it's not enough to call on Albany to make changes to mandatory fee statutes for indigent defendants and fund our courts in ways that don't make them reliant on fines and fees. The city itself has an impact. Our prosecutors have an impact. Where diversion opportunities or alternatives to incarceration are offered, many of which are administered by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, we must make sure that defendants are able to participate. 
where classes such as a batter intervention or DWI program are mandated by the court or made a necessary precursor for a defendant to see their child or regain their driver's license, money should not stand in the way. For example, one program requires 16 sessions at $50 each, plus an additional orientation fee. Should completion of a program hinge on the ability to find $850 just to participate? Just as important is who we choose to prosecute and for what. A study by the Bronx Defenders found from, that from 2009 to 2013, before the city and its DAs made their first attempt to reduce marijuana enforcement, court fees and fines assessed for low-level marijuana possession totaled approximately $11 million citywide. How many fewer of those individuals are being arrested today? How many of them are receiving a violation? And tomorrow, how can we make that number zero? How much more can we reduce the effect of our criminal justice system on largely black and brown people that cycle through it? With every arrest we choose not to make, with every case we choose not to pursue, we can reduce the cost of justice for everyone. I look forward to hearing today from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, public defenders, advocates, and others about the impact of this system uh, here in New York City and ideas for how we can improve on it. With that, um, we're going to swear in our witnesses, and we'll hear your testimony. So if you can raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Terrific. Um, unless you have some other uh, idea, why don't we just start from, from my left to, to right. Um, please introduce yourself, and, and let's hear your testimony. You have to hit the, the button, the red light. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Hamangi Pai. I'm a senior trial attorney in the Brooklyn Adolescent Re Representation Team, known as BART, at Brooklyn Defender Services. BART is a specialized unit with dedicated attorneys and social workers representing young people ages 14 to 24 who are charged with crimes from petty, low-level crimes to serious felonies in Brooklyn. In my almost eight years at BDS, I've represented hundreds, if not thousands, of young people. These young people are poor, mostly black and Latinx. Most of their cases end with a plea, which includes fines and fees. Fees including mandatory surcharges that are routinely imposed without any assessment of a client's ability to pay. The consequences of non-payment for our young clients are dire. Ruined credit, denial of access to housing, inability for college loans, and employment discrimination. I have hundreds of stories of young people who've been disproportionately impacted by fees and fines, but I'd like to share one example that I think best illustrates the consequences our young people face. My, my client, we can call her Catherine, was charged with theft of services for entering the subway system without paying. She doubled up in the turnstile with her friend. She was immediately arrested and because she didn't have any identification on her, she was processed, taken to central booking, and then brought to court. When I met her in weekend arraignments on a Sunday night, she was terrified. She was offered a plea to disorderly conduct, a violation of the law, not even a crime, and she agreed to take the plea. And then she was saddled with a surcharge of $120 that she did not have, that her family did not have. She was 17 years old, was in high school and lived in a shelter with her mother and siblings. And at that moment, she had a choice to make about the surcharge. Should she ask for time to pay or ask for a civil judgment to be entered? She asked the court for time to pay and the case was adjourned for about eight weeks for her to pay. Catherine didn't know how she was gonna pay the surcharge, but the alternative was so much worse. If she had asked for a civil judgment, there would have been a default on her credit report at the age of 17. This young girl who is just starting her life, who is planning to go to college, maybe one day hopefully move out of the shelter into her own place, who would apply for loans and jobs, could not afford to have a judgment on her credit report for seven years, from 17 to 24. A judgment that would prevent her from taking out financial aid, from getting an apartment, from getting medical insurance, from getting employment, from so much more. So she chose to ask for time to pay. 
Catherine's family pulled the money together to pay. It took them some time and they had to ask for an extension, which meant Catherine had to come back to court more than once after that first date. The money they used, the $120, was money that her mother pulled from the needs of their household, from their clothing, their food, necessities for the other children. And that money could have been used for something so much more productive for that family. It could have been used for something so much more productive for Catherine, for school books, for college applications, for anything else. Instead, it was money that she had to pay because the surcharge is mandatory, cannot be waived, and because the alternative was so much worse. And this was all because she doubled up in a turnstile, because she could not afford $2.75 for the subway fare. Now this is just one of hundreds of stories I could share with you about all the negative impact of fees and fines on our poor clients. Young people from middle class families who can afford to pay the court costs on their behalf face a mere inconvenience, while people from poor families face what is in many cases a longer lasting punishment than the sentence. She received time served in this case and had to come back at least two times to deal with the surcharge. I list a number of recommendations in my testimony and I urge the council to do the following. Compile and publish a publicly available list of all the fines, fees, and surcharges imposed on New Yorkers by the criminal legal system. Require reporting on the number of New York City residents who are incarcerated or had their driver's license suspended because of their inability to pay a fine, surcharge, or fee, and the number of civil judgments issued against defendants by the courts, sometimes even in their absence. If the court imposes any user fees on criminal defendants, the council should eliminate them or allow judges or clerks to waive them for indigent people. Additionally, the city should eliminate other costs imposed on incarcerated people and their families, such as J-Pay services, charges, and fines for alleged infractions in city jails. The city should address, or, I'm sorry, assess current criminal debt collection practices with particular attention to the practices of private debt collection agencies. Often there are little to no enforceable regulations when people attempt to seek recourse against these entities for abuse or misconduct. And the council should join advocates to call on, New York State on the New York State Legislature to eliminate or significantly limit most court fines and fees and call for broader discretion for judges to waive them for indigent defendants, including calling for the passage of A7, A9786 S7917, a bill that passed the New York State Assembly earlier this year that would authorize judges to waive certain surcharges and fees for a defendant under the age of 21 under certain circumstances. Brooklyn Defender Services strongly believes that people should never be incarcerated due to failure to pay criminal court debt, especially if the court has not made an ability to pay determination. People should never be saddled with a civil judgment for failure to pay criminal legal debt absent a court det determination that they are not indigent, i.e. able to pay without unreasonable hardship. Fees and fines should be tailored to an individual's ability to pay and courts should be allowed to reduce or eliminate such fines and fees based on a person's change in circumstances. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Chairman Lansman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dawi Gitacho. I'm a criminal defense attorney and associate special counsel at the Bronx Defenders. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, testify about this important matter. Uh, the Bronx Defenders is a community-based, holistic public defender office dedicated to serving the people of the Bronx. The Bronx Defenders provides criminal defense, family defense, immigration representation, civil legal services, and social services to approximately 28,000 Bronx residents every year. Now, for many of our clients, the financial penalties imposed as a result of an open criminal case or a conviction are perhaps the most common forms of, uh, of punishment levied against them by the criminal legal system. Those who plead guilty regularly face fines of, or monetary sanctions, including fines, mandatory surcharges, and court fees, program costs that can add up to a staggering sum far beyond their ability to pay. For those who choose to fight their case, 
Just the act of appearing in court numerous times waiting for their day in court has significant financial costs in the form of lost wages, school absences, transportation and childcare expenses, which further strains the resources of individuals already living on the economic margins. I agree with my colleague from BDS stated uh, with respect to mandatory court surcharges, which are imposed whenever people are convicted of an offense and represent, which represent the largest pool of money that's extracted from people involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, for example, a guilty plea to the non-criminal violation of disorderly conduct, which is one of the most common dispositions across the city, carries with it a mandatory court surcharge of $120. And this year alone, the Bronx defenders, uh, uh, the clients that we have represented, have taken over 1,700 pleas to disorderly conduct for a total of over 200,000 man mandatory court surcharges. And this represents just a fraction of these costs, both in the Bronx as well as citywide. <clears throat> I would like uh, to highlight a particular area um, that, has, that hasn't been addressed, uh, specifically the cost of treatment services or programs that often serve as an alternative to incarceration. Uh, which can be a significant financial burden to many of our clients. Uh, this is especially true for uh, people without health insurance and those with limited English proficiency. Uh, for example, uh, Angelo, a Bronx Defenders client and a father of seven, was arrested and pled guilty to a family offense uh, arising from his struggle with alcohol addiction. Uh, the condition of his sentence required him to complete an alcohol treatment program as an alternative to incarceration. Now, Angelo sought a free or low-cost uh, cost treatment program because although he was employed, he did not have insurance um, and would, would have been difficult for him to pay for these programs, which can cost up to $50 per session or more. Now, we conducted an exhaustive search for a free or sliding scale program offered in Spanish that could also fulfill the conditions of the sentence. The only program that was available was in a different borough and was untenable due to the hours it offered treatment. Unable to complete the program and unable to pay the cost for a more convenient one, Angelo could not comply with the mandated conditions. As a result, he was resentenced to seven days of incarceration. Now, Angelo is not alone. Many of our Spanish-speaking clients are disproportionately impacted by this financial burden of uh, the criminal justice involvement. Now, this financial uh, burden is not limited to fees that are assessed after people enter a guilty plea. The fees begin to accumulate as soon as people step into the courtroom. For example, individuals who are accused of DWI offenses are ordered to, to undergo an alcohol screening and assessment uh, as, uh, following arraignment. The cost for these screenings can range anywhere between $75 to $150, even for those with health insurance. The costs only escalate if individuals are found to be in need of treatment. <clears throat> More significantly, fees for programs and services can also be a significant barrier to a meaningful resolution of a case. Often, our clients express uh, a desire to actually participate in programs uh, during the pendency of their criminal case to address the issues that may have brought them into the system in the first place. Uh, prosecutors and defense attorneys also turn to these programs with an eye of a more favorable resolution to, to a case. I'd like to tell you about a young client of mine uh, as an example, um, Glenn, who he was arrested for a misdemeanor, and Glenn had expressed an interest in attending a program to address sexual behavior issues while his case was open. Uh, the prosecutor in the case also believed that it would be helpful for uh, the purposes of reaching a, a, a plea agreement. Now, there's no question that these types of programs play an important role of rehabilitation and support long-term concerns of public health and safety. However, such treatment programs uh, can be very expensive beyond our clients' abilities uh, to pay. Some of these programs can cost $50 a session for a period that lasts several months or even longer. 
And in the case of Glenn, we we're unable to find any programs that actually accepted his insurance and could accommodate his work schedule. The option to do a program such as Mustard Seed was out of pocket was simply impossible for someone with his income. Given that he was unable to do a similar program, the court sentenced him to probation. Now, this was a moment that was a missed opportunity for all parties for people to address long-term issues that could have helped everyone. Now, we would ask that expanding the access and availability of programs at low, uh, at low or no cost to individuals, especially those programs which are per, uh, serving those who might be deemed as unpopular is extremely important. It would not only ease the financial burden to low-income individuals, but also it's also good public policy that addresses important public health and safety concerns. Financial sa sanctions that disproportionately punish the poorest among us in the interest of raising revenue has no place in our justice system. The Bronx Offenders finds encouraging that the, commi the committee's inquiry into this issue and we're eager to support your efforts to address the obstacles faced by the most economically vulnerable New Yorkers. I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and your attention to this subject. Thank you. Good morning. I want to thank you for your interest in fines and fees and for creating a forum to discuss how we can stop punishing New Yorkers for their poverty. My name is Joanna Weiss. I'm the co-director of the Fines and Fees Justice Center. We're a national organization that seeks to eliminate fees in the justice system and make sure that fines are equitably uh, imposed and enforced. Fines and fees are hurting New Yorkers and they're hurting New York City. They make our communities less safe, they perpetuate and exacerbate poverty, and they extract millions of dollars from our most vulnerable communities and particularly from communities of color. Um, a lot of the uh, fines and fees that we've discussed this morning are state mandated and in my written testimony uh, I go into detail about some of those and ask that the council advocate for an end to the state imposed uh, fines and fees, particularly the end of driver's license suspensions for outstanding fines and the use of mandatory fees and surcharges. But I want to focus this morning on some of the things that I think that the council can do without the assistance of Albany. First, in all five boroughs, prosecutors and courts are offering diversion programs and alternatives to incarceration for people who are accused or convicted of crimes, but really don't pose a danger to society. Um, inexcusably, and perhaps illegally, uh, many of those diversion programs are only available to people who can pay the costs and fees associated with them. For example, in Staten Island, there is a DUI diversion program uh, where if you participate in this program, it's a 90-day program, at the end you will avoid incarceration and you will not end up with a criminal record. However, that program costs up to $14 a day. So if you have access to up to $1,260 in 90 days, you can participate in this program and leave the system. Uh, for people who can't afford to pay, they're incarcerated uh, and end up with a criminal record. The vast majority of justice-involved people are indigent and they are disproportionately people of color. Diversion and alternatives to incarceration are good for everyone. And the council should ensure that all diversion programs are offered for free, or at a minimum, they should be free for anyone who can't afford to pay, so that they don't have to choose between important diversion programs and the financial security of their families. New York City also imposes a $30 per month DWI probation supervision fee. Now this isn't a fine or a punishment that's meant to deter DWIs, this is a tax. And it's an extremely regressive one that tries to charge the cost of the justice system to the so-called users. User fees have no place in the justice system. The justice system is a core government function that serves all of us and should be funded by all of us. And so the council should, should abolish any and all probation fees. Uh, third, the council should also abolish fees that are charged to people who are currently incarcerated in New York City, including money transfer fees, uh, fees to access voicemail, um, fees for disciplinary tickets, and ensure that no one's commissary is ever garnished to pay off fines and fees that they can't afford. We call on council to eliminate all discretionary fees it imposes in the justice system, fees that under state law, the state may but doesn't have to impose. 
Last month, the city of San Francisco became the, the city, first. The city may. That the city may, impose, okay. but does not have to impose. Yes, thank you. Um, last month, the city of San Francisco became the first city and county in the United States to end the use of all discretionary fees, including probation, including supervision fees. Alameda County and several other counties in California are considering following suit. We asked the city council for New York City to follow San Francisco's lead uh, in equitably funding the justice system and abolishing the use of fees. And finally, in addition to eliminating the fees uh, that I identified in this testimony, the council should also follow San Francisco's lead and create an office for economic justice. That office would identify all of the fines and fees that the city imposes, collect relevant data, and work with the council, the mayor's office, and city agencies to eliminate discretionary fees, reduce racial disparities, and make sure that fines are proportionate to the offense and to a person's ability to pay. An office for economic justice could also help the city overcome one of the biggest hurdles that we have in grappling with the impacts of fines and fees on the people of New York City, and that's the availability of data. We ask the council to ensure that going, for, that going forward, the city will track and transparently share data on the imposition of fines and fees. Um, I include in my written testimony some of those data points that I think we should be tracking as a city. The, city for of the Office for Economic Justice should also pilot graduated economic sa sanctions or day fines. Um, the Fines and Fees Justice Center would be very glad to, to provide any assistance to the council or to a newly um, created Office for Economic Justice to implement means-adjusted fines. Um, for example, at the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings, at no point in that process is a person's ability to pay ever considered. The Office for Economic Justice should also investigate all fines and make sure that they're not disproportionately issued to people of color, and they should investigate all allegations of perverse incentives to issue fines, such as those alleged in a recent lawsuit by 12 New York City police officers. I want to thank you for the opportunity to address these important issues and again reiterate that the Fines and Fees Justice Center stands ready to help the council to implement any of the reforms that I discussed. Thank you all for your for your for your testimony and particularly the um, the examples that you brought forth of individuals who were negatively impacted by the the system that we have in place um, and and particularly also for your your focus on things that the city can can do itself. Later, we're going to hear testimony from from Mark J and we're going to ask them uh, their thoughts on 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 those things, but. Um, let me uh, let me ask uh, go through some of the, the suggestions that you had in your uh, in your testimonies. Um, in your in your uh, and I guess this is for the public defenders, but but maybe you have experience as well. Um, have have you uh, uh, asked the court or 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 individual programs? To, to waive the, 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 the costs of participating in these, in these programs? Is that something that is, that, is, that is ever considered? Do some programs do that and others don't? Tell me about any efforts that you've made to say, hey, my client just can't afford XYZ program. What, what kind of relief can he or she get? Um, so in my experience, I have asked the court to consider uh, program consider waiving fees unfortunately the court doesn't have a lot of authority I don't think to do that because it's the program itself right who charges the client whatever they charge the client I've had um, many conversations with various pro providers asking if they can reduce the fee set a s sliding scale anything like that many of them require um, health insurance which often our clients don't have so they're um, eliminated from doing the program or ineligible for the program to start off with and those that require payment up front sort of have their sliding scale is at minimum fifty dollars right that's the least amount that they will accept and that is a lot of money for our poor clients who you know can't even sometimes afford two dollars and seventy five cents for um, a subway fare so there's not a lot of we, we try I mean I can speak for the people in my office we try we try to push back on that but there's not a lot that we can do um, to change providers minds when it comes to 
billing, right? And so that's that's difficult for us. There are, um, and, and when it comes to the to the surcharges, we are not in a position. Well, we've asked for surcharges to be waived, and courts have repeatedly said no. Do, do the courts have the authority to waive the surcharge? No. No. Okay. And particularly with felonies, there's absolutely no. There's not even a civil judgment. So, you know, you're doing a upstate time maybe, and you're working in an upstate prison for two cents an hour. All half of your money is going to, to all, most of your commissary is going to paying your fines. Mm -hmm. If your mom puts twenty dollars in your account, ten of it is going to pay your fines and surcharges. Mm -hmm. Respect to your question regarding uh, waiver surcharges, my understanding is a New York State law allows deferment of uh, surcharges, but not remission or waiver of uh, those surcharges. And that was actually uh, legislation that changed over the years. I believe it was uh, in the 90s, uh, where judges actually had the authority uh, to waive such fees. However, that uh, before various reasons that and including being the ideas of being tough on crime and raising revenue which is an important piece here um, led to changes uh, in the law if i could just say one other thing i think um, in the context of youthful offender we've had success when a client is afforded youthful a youthful offender adjudication there is some waiver but that I mean, I, I, would con I would ask the council to consider a resolution on raising the age for youthful offender adjudications because there are some um, instances where we can get some of the fi fines and surcharges waived because of youthful offender. But that doesn't apply in the context of a disorderly conduct where that's not even implicated because it's a violation of the law and not even a crime. Is it common for uh, it to be explained to defendants who are pleading to these low-level offenses who at, at the moment might just be grateful to, to put this behind them in, in their mind or they're not pleading to the felony, they're pleading to the misdemeanor, they're not pleading to the misdemeanor, they're pleading to the violation, that, that there are these, these fees that then surcharges that are going to come, come with it? Yes. Um, in my practice, um, every time I speak with a client about taking any kind of plea, I tell them about all of the consequences, including uh, the surcharge that is attached and what that, you know, what the consequences are. Like in my, my example with Ka with my client Catherine, that was a conversation that I had with her. If you take this plea, there's also a $120 mandatory court surcharge. I can't, the court cannot waive it. You can ask for time to pay. These are the consequences if you don't pay. And, um, you know, we always take that into consideration when we're, when we're negotiating a plea and when we're speaking to our clients about taking a plea. Let me, and yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> just to add to that, uh, while we generally uh, advise people about the consequences of not paying the mandatory surcharge, what's particularly difficult uh, is, for example, in DWI offenses, which have numerous sorts of uh, fines as well as civil penalties, that makes it difficult for defense attorneys to properly and fully advise as uh, to so the full. Uh, plethora of like financial consequences that may occur. We may tell them about the fines and surcharges that are being assessed by the court, but not necessarily what the program is going to be charging them, what DMV is going to be charging them, how long that process is going to take. And that is certainly uh, something that's going to be significant as uh, for uh, uh, fulfilling the conditions of the sentence. For example, installation of uh, an ignition interlock device costs money for installation as well as monthly monthly ma maintenance. Uh, the, the amount is decided by individual businesses uh, that actually profit of the installation and maintenance of the IID, um, and it can be very costly uh, for uh, individuals. So some uh, individuals pay up to uh, 90 to $100 a month for maintenance of uh, these machines, as well as additional costs are associated with installing and um, uh, deinstalling the, uh, these machines. And even in, in the context of um, traffic infractions, like driving without a license, there often is a fine attached, like a $75 fine when you take a plea to vehicle and traffic law section 509, which is driving without a license. And then there's a surcharge on top of that. And in my experience and what I've learned is that when you go to pay the amount um, at, the, at the cashier's office, 
the first amount that comes out is the mandatory surcharge. So if I, but the but the amount that attaches to potential jail consequences is the seventy five dollar fine. So you, if you're poor and you have seventy five dollars and you would like to attach that to your fine, so you can pay off your fine, which could potentially, if you don't pay it, land you in jail for fifteen days. It's not going to that first. It's going to the mandatory eighty eight dollar court surcharge, and you're left with the fine. Right. So the, so. If you've got 100 bucks in your pocket, the first $88 are going to the surcharge, which if you couldn't pay the surcharge, the cert not paying the surcharge, failure to pay the surcharge doesn't result in a warrant, correct? No, it it's results fine, in civil judgment. Right, it's the fine and it's the restitution right. that will result in, in, in a warrant. In our experience, yes. Yeah. Um, have you had uh, clients, are you aware of people who are, who are in a program and then cannot make the fifty dollars a month or whatever it is, and then they are, they are kicked out of the program. Yes, um, I I think some providers try to work with clients on that, but there have been I've had maybe, you know I've I've done hundreds of cases, but I can think of at least three in the context of, uh, you know, an intervention program, maybe in a domestic violence situation where the client is unable to pay and their sessions are suspended until they're able to make payments. In the DWI context, it's similar uh, where, they're, where they owe a tremendous amount of money and their services may be suspended, keeping them coming back to court for longer and longer and longer to resolve their case. Um, and then we have instances, many instances, especially with programs such as Mustard Seed and others, where there's a requirement for um, insurance. And if you don't have insurance, and oftentimes our poor clients do not have insurance, they are ineligible right at the gate, right at the door. So they don't even have the opportunity to begin the program. And, and um, as my colleague here said, a much needed program for everyone in the community, for everyone involved. Yeah, I mean, it's very troubling the story that you told about the, the young man who was arrested mm -hmm. for, for, I think it was public lewdness and his years that's testified correct. he wanted to participate in a program and he was offered to participate in a program and he couldn't do it so he got a year of probation who, who, who wins there we call that a softball you're gonna swing <laughs> it's very, it. it's like you're absolutely swing hard. right I, I, I do think that um, especially when it comes to programs that, such as this which may be deemed as unpopular uh, but certainly very necessary um, the options uh, for our clients are very, very limited, precisely because of the uh, reasons th that my colleague just stated. Uh, but more importantly, um, the, the sheer um, financial costs for these programs, even when you have insurance, uh, it's ex incredibly expensive, $50 a session. Uh, some sessions, it could be m multiple sessions a week or at least at the minimum right. once a week. And, and these programs last several months, over six months to a year. So it can have a tremendous imp impact on our clients and we do have experiences where clients have been unable to continue uh, because uh, they could not afford uh, to pay the uh, the out-of-pocket costs for these programs. And then, and then, sorry, and then what happens to them? Like they're back into the, the criminal proceeding and they're going to get some kind of, some kind of sentence. The determination <clears throat> uh, ends up uh, be, uh, before the court and uh, really de depends on uh, a lot of factors and the advocacy that's being presented. May, perhaps uh, our role as defense attorneys at, at those moments is to figure out other options as best as we can. Um, it's possible if uh, probation is mandating these programs uh, or parole is mandating these programs, they can certainly be a violation if they're not complying with, uh, with, with the orders. And there's often very little that our clients can do in those situations. And the reality is they're facing a jail alternative in most of those situations because those are mostly, po not, not all the time, but often post-plea cases where there's a plea taken and there's a jail alternative hanging over the person's head so that if they don't complete the program, then there is a likely chance, and depending on which judge you're in front of, the circumstances of the case, all of that, um, you can be facing whatever the jail alternative is. If it's a misdemeanor plea, it can be up to a year in jail because you're poor and you can't afford to do the program that you want to do. The other thing is, um, just in terms of uh, paying, 
when it requires a, a person who could have resolved their case right there in arraignments or on that particular day in court to come back to court to pay. They, in Brooklyn, you have to, you're either paying with a money order, so then you have to pay additional money to get a money order, or you pay with a credit card, and we're not sure exactly if there's a charge for a credit card, if there's a credit card fee. If there's restitution, um, there is a 5% surcharge on the restitution amount. So there's just, a, there are also additional costs that come with all of these fines and fees. Mm -hmm such as t maybe taking a day off from work to be able to come down and pay so that you're not in violation and who knows how long the line is that day in the cashier's office, who knows how long the line is in, at security. So you could be missing an entire day's worth of work just to be able to pay, pay these fines and fees. And the, um, the, the monthly probation supervision fee, could I, um, I was surprised to learn about about that one. Um, I actually will say readily, I was at uh, the Smart on Crime conference at, uh, at John Jay College a couple of days ago, and I confronted the commissioner of probation about that. And uh, she didn't feel free to speak about it when she was on the panel. She was talking about the progress that had been made in probation. But it is a uh, New York City bill that <clears throat> allows DWI probation to be charged $30 a month for everyone who's and, under a And is it just DWI? Just DWI. Mm. And I will say in other counties, we can be proud, in other counties, everyone under parole and probation is charged $30 a month. Um, but there's really no place at all for probation fees. Yeah. Are you aware of instances where, where somebody couldn't make that fee? What happens if they couldn't make the fee? The city eventually converts it to a civil judgment, or, the, or they, <clears throat> are, they, are they violated? What, what, what happens? Do I don't know? know, and I think okay. we need to know from the Department of Probation yeah. what happens. Um, right. But because it's such a disproportionate tax that are only hitting really vulnerable communities and tend to be disproportionately hitting communities of color, we really shouldn't be having probation fees at all in a city that's as progress as interested in, in uh, progressive values and economic justice. Right. Well, thank you very much. This has been very, very helpful. <clears throat> Each of you, your testimony was very comprehensive, and and um, and I appreciate particularly the examples of what the city could do to improve the the system. So, thank you. Um, the Drug Policy Alliance, the Fortune Society, and the Bronx Freedom Fund. And then we'll break that up with Mock J and then have other folks testify. Is anyone who needs to, who is planning to testify in any particular rush? I mean, this is not going to be an excessively long hearing, but, you know, we would try. Lori, yes, you're in a rush? Yes. That's okay. So, Queens Law Associates, come on down. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're in a rush, so. We'll make another okay. seat. We got <laughs> plenty. We got chairs. All right, let's get everyone sworn in and we'll get started. If you could all raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Terrific. Um, Lori, why don't you lead us off since, uh, since you're in a rush?
press it. Oh, okay, there we go. One, I thank you very much, uh, Councilman, for um, this courtesy. Uh, and, but also I thank you for um, being interested in this subject and, um, and being interested in what the city can do um, in order to make a difference. Um, I know that I'm following the other public defender groups, so I'm actually gonna sort of uh, just sort of, okay, sorry. Um, I just want to sort of pick up on some of the things that the other defender offices were talking about so I'm, I'm not repeating uh, what they said. Um, one of the things that, um, well, in Queens, obviously, you know, both criminal and Supreme Court, our clients have to choose on a daily basis. Um, uh, can they pay or do they stay? Um, you know, and there are two different ways in which clients have to make that choice. One is it the diversion way that uh, the, you know the other offices were talking about, the betters intervention programs, the pre-plea programs, and then there's the post-conviction fines. Now, with regard to the pre-plea programs, uh, I think that the city can do a lot um, because the programs that our clients are going to are already funded by the city to give those services to their communities, just like we're funded to represent 30,000 people a year in Queens County when they're charged with a crime. So when they come to our office and we then represent them in court, we don't charge them because we're already getting funded by the city. So, you know, just as these other diversion programs are being funded. Um, I'm not, I actually don't understand why they then are allowed to charge the client when they come in for that service. So in my opinion, I think that that's a place that can be, uh, you know, sort of looked into and, and maybe there needs to be a little more funding or, I, you know, I don't know what their issues are, but, um, you know, because it is true that these programs uh, are very prohibitive for our clients. Um, you know, when you look at the people who tend to be arrested, um, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, African American, Latino uh, communities. You're talking about people with mental illness, people who are dropouts from high school, or, you know, they don't, they're not people that are wealthy, right? And so for one of the examples I wanted to point out on, say, the, the, the vehicle and traffic laws, there's a section, section VTL 511, that's what you're driving with a suspended license. So there are two, there's the 511A and a 511B and C, you know, there's the little subsections. So, you know, what we use a lot is we, we're concerned about a, fi, a VTL 511 is actually a misdemeanor. So it's a convi there's a conviction, a criminal conviction, versus uh, there's another subsection on the 511 that is not. It's a violation and, or a traffic infraction. But in order to take a plea to that section, the fee is like $500 right and but if you take it on the other section and you get the criminal conviction it's less so um for those people who can afford you know to pay those kinds of things they get this great deal right they they've done the exact same crime they've pled to the exact same thing but because they have more money they get to pay the higher fine and walk away without a criminal conviction and then the other people if they're lucky and and even can can pay that you know they're they're walking away with a criminal conviction so it's not just whether or not they have to stay in jail it's really what they plead to as well um, for the very same crimes um, so these these programs um, are they charge in Queens anyway like you know I had my uh, social worker you know unit put together a list of these intervention programs and what their charges are and they range you know they all have registration fees so that's usually around $35 
but can be up to $65 just to register for the program. Then you have an intake fee after you've registered because somebody's going to meet with you and find out your information, right? So that's going to cost uh, an average of $70. So just to walk in the door, you're, it's $100. Then if you're going to sign up for sessions, whether they're individual sessions or group sessions, that ranges between $25 and $50 per session. Now, some of these programs are 12 weeks long. Some of them are th 24 weeks. Some of them are 36 weeks. And, you know, especially the programs involving DWIs, those programs go on forever and the fees that you have to pay in criminal court do not take into consideration the fees that you have to pay through the DMV as well um, and uh, some programs have like to be even ROR'd right you can put a monitoring device on and uh, because the, peop the person can't afford bail so you go and you try to get them to give them, uh, how about if we monitor them or whatever, right? You gotta pay $10 a day to have that device um, on in order for, for that to happen. Now, we in Queens have a particular problem. Um, you asked the other offices, you know, what do they do to try to reduce this problem for their clients, right? So we, we try to find other programs all the time that have lower fees, that have lower, um, you know, they'll waive a registration fee or they'll combine sessions, right? So that you can, instead of going one hour a week, you can go two hours a week and pay the same amount of money, but cut your fees in half because you're cutting your time in half, right? Even though you're still getting the same number of hours. So we do things like that all the time. And, you know, we'll even go to the DA's office and we'll say, listen, you know, this client really should get this program but can't afford it. And there are times where we'll get a scholarship, you know, where the DA will call the program and say, listen, you know, don't charge them or whatever. And they work out whatever they work out. And, and that'll happen. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Um, However, there seems to be like a list in Queens of the programs that have been vetted through the DA's office, right? So they vet these programs and then they get them together and then they all decide what the fees are going to be. So, you know, if I'm program A, Right, and I come to the meeting and I've been vetted and the DA's office likes me and I say, okay, my fee to come into my program is $25 a session, but you know, B, C, and D, their fees are $50 a session. The DA's office says to me, well, if you wanna be on our list, you need to increase and charge $50 a session like the other two groups. I'm sorry. <clears throat> what is the DA's I knew that would get your attention. <laughs> what is the DA's office's incentive in, in having higher fees? The fees go to the DA's office? No, they don't go to the DA's office, but the DA's incentive is to control the programs that are selected or approved uh, by the court, right, to allow the client to go. For instance, we, in my office, we found a program where um, he'll charge $10 a session and he'll double the sessions so that instead of paying 20 for two sessions, you're paying 10 and like that, right? And, um, but the DA's office needs to vet that program. So they'll vet it and they fi if they like it or whatever, but for, I don't really know why they do it, to be honest with you. I think it's only been in recent years that that's been done, but I think it, it enables them to control who they choose to be a program and whether or not they approve. And, and then they don't want it to be, well, we're gonna pick, 20 people are gonna pick this group because they're only $10, and two people will pick this group because it's $25, right? So he wants it to even out for everybody. And then everybody's happy and then everybody, like that and so I see. so the, the DA might have an incentive in order to distribute clients 
Yeah, and, and to programs that they think are good enough, right? right? Or that... They don't want one program under undercutting other programs. Exactly. All right. All right, good. So let's we'll, uh, go along, and then we'll ask questions of Thank everybody. You. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. All right. Um, uh, you want to go, Khalil? Okay. okay. Up to you. <laughs> good morning. Um, Thank you, Councilman, for the opportunity to testify and again for your interest in this matter. Um, I'll try to be brief. Uh, there's more details in my written testimony. Um, but anyway, my name is Elena Weissman. I'm the director of the Bronx Freedom Fund. We're a community bail fund, which for over 10 years has provided bail assistance to thousands of New Yorkers in the Bronx and in Queens who would otherwise be incarcerated for their poverty. And today I'd like to discuss the cost of justice for our clients and for their loved ones, all of whom are directly impacted by a system that criminalizes poverty. And so I'll be focusing um, on a stage earlier than the public defenders, which is pre-trial, um, not in terms of diversion, but in terms of the costs of paying bail. Um, and we're excited to see the city taking strides to end the unnecessary and unjust incarceration. Um, and what I want to do today is to talk about how the, these administrative reforms should halt the practice of extracting wealth from New York City's most impoverished and vulnerable communities. So we were excited to see the council make phone calls free from jail um, and to regulate the exploitative bail bonds industry. And I think that the topics that we're talking about today are definitely coming on the heels of that. Um, and we hope that the council will use that same moral reasoning for other modes of wealth extraction. Um, and in particular, what I'm referring to is online bail payment, credit card bail payment, cash transfers to people's commissary accounts when they're incarcerated, and posting $1 bail. Um, and I won't go into detail about the first three of those, but um, there, it goes into to depth, greater depth than my written testimony. But just briefly, there's a 2.49% non-refundable fee to pay bail online, a 7% non-refundable fee to pay bail with a credit card, and a 20% fee to deposit money online in a commissary account. And so each of these methods are supposed to increase access to paying bail. Um, and I just want to do it. So it's 2.9% fee to pay online? 2.49, yeah. 2.49. It's 7% 7 7 to pay with a credit, credit card. card. At a jail. At a jail. Yeah. Right. And the cash transfers to commissary accounts, there's, what is that? I think it might be up to 20%. That's like what people have told us. I don't know. I haven't seen mm -hmm. a written policy of what it we'll, is, and it's we'll, less we'll, if you go we'll at the Mark facility. Okay. So, yeah. right. But e so each of these things are for paying online, which are supposed to increase ease of access. Um, and with average bails around $2,500, that could mean $238 non-refundable. And that really could mean the difference between incarceration and freedom, especially when there's only 12% of New Yorkers who can afford their bail whatsoever. Um, so I'll just skip over to the dollar bail system, which I think um, is easier to illustrate in person. Um, so. This is, I think, one of the most particularly outlandish fee structures imposed by the courts. It's the, the $1 bail system. Um, and it serves a purpose. It's to track multiple cases at once, I'm sure you know. Um, but what ends up happening, and from our end, what we see is that we receive referrals almost every day for individuals who are trapped in jail on a single dollar. And they're people whose other cases have been dismissed or otherwise resolved and are now in on one, two, or three dollars. Um, these individuals often do not even know that they could be released. And even if they do, they might not have funds in their commissary in order to self-pay it or anyone on the outside who can make a trip to the jail. And even for those who do have the necessary commissary funds, the Department of Correction automatically docks the outstanding fines and fees from their commissary before it can be used for bail. And I really think the dollar bail system can underscore the need for systemic bail reform that can halt the practice of incarcerating people based on their financial access. And so we urge the city to explore creative solutions to that in the meantime. And um, I know a lot of people have talked about kind of waiting for Albany. Um, and I do think that absent systemic reform that happens at the state level that would end the criminalization of poverty in terms of bail altogether, a system that grants accommodation to low-income New Yorkers is imperative. And I understand that the New York court system has an existing metric for determining indigency, and this calculus, we think, should be extended to the collateral costs of fighting a criminal case. And what that would look like was that if an individual is deemed indigent and granted a public defender, they should also have their fees waived from online and credit card bail payment, money transfers, and dollar bail. Access to cash, however small the sum may seem, should not determine a person's liberty. 
New York City Council already demonstrated its leadership in this field by making phone calls from New York City jails free and by calling out the bail bonds industry for exploiting those ensnared in the court system. This proposal, again, comes on the heels of those changes and it's part of a trend towards a system that humanizes instead of criminalizes. This conversation must be underscored by an acknowledgement of the broader costs borne by individuals trapped in pretrial detention, their loved ones, and com our communities writ large. The bail system is the fuel for mass incarceration, and it's what makes these costs of justice that I've discussed so pronounced. When people are incarcerated on bail they can't afford, they risk losing their housing, livelihood, even custody of their children. Their loved ones lose hours of work, childcare, and other responsibilities when they spend time and money going to visit their loved ones in a facility, attempt to post bail, or deposit money in their accounts. With the exorbitant fees required for online money transfers and bail payments, many people are turned away from these options even when they are a possibility. New, York's, New York already pays $116 million every year to incarcerate thousands of people for their inability to post bail, and we shoulder an even broader cost in lost wages, shelter costs, and most importantly, moral capital when these individuals are locked up. Our work at the Freedom Fund is a temporary stopgap measure focused on harm reduction before we reach meaningful reform. These proposed changes will further mitigate the harm of a system that even allows wealth-based detention while we focus our long-term energies on fighting for systemic change. So thank you for your commitment um, to ending the criminalization of poverty and for hearing my testimony today. Thank you. Sir? Ma'am. Sorry. Yep. Um, my name is Deanna King. I'm the policy manager with the Drug Policy Alliance. Uh, we are an organization that advocates uh, for policy that advances attitudes uh, around drug use uh, and supports harm reduction uh, and instant prohibition of drug use while promoting sovereignty of individuals over their minds and bodies. Um, a lot of the issues that I wanted to focus on were already touched on by our, my allies with the defenders, organizations, and people on this panel, so I won't bore you by repeating all that stuff. And you also touched on a lot of issues during your opening testimony, so I just wanted to use this opportunity uh, to highlight some of the things that um, the council can do uh, to remedy some of these issues, uh, while also calling out the perverse nature of the criminal courts using um, low-income uh, communities of color as a source of revenue to fund the courts. Um, one of the things that hasn't really been touched on um, in this uh, morning's testimony was just how much money uh, criminal courts is uh, garnering from low-income communities and how they categorize that money. So looking at the New York City's Comptroller Report from 2016, um, they have under their milestones that they were able to generate some upwards to $30 million um, from fines and fees um, derived from summonses um, and the criminalization of communities. So I think it is uh, a little reprehensible, uh, morally bereft, to, to, to put that amount of money as a milestone um, in the ways that the courts function. It shouldn't be about the amount of money that they're receiving uh, to fund the courts, but how they are supporting uh, public safety um, and the wellness of the city. So the fact that they are considering that an area of uh, success as opposed to a place of harm is really uh, problematic when we're looking at this issue. Um, going forward, like, as someone who works specifically in uh, drug policy, I'm really shocked to hear about the amount of money that people are being charged to put in ATI diversion programs. It's one of the things that we always promote. Um, instead of putting people in the justice system, put them in areas where they can um, uh, better serve themselves and reduce the harms of their behavior. But if they can't enter those programs based on the amount of money that they're charged for treatment or um, diversion programs in general, like that is a barrier in and of itself. Um, and as my colleagues have said, there's no, um, the courts do not have to provide any funding to make sure that people can have access to those programs. And there's also the other prob problems that a lot of these programs aren't really measured for effectiveness. Um, the commercial sector is able to both profit from the courts by having people in these courts being you know, sent to their programs without even demonstrating any kind of functionality that these programs are effective. So you've touched on this, um, but the, the programs that exist in your community um, and the fact that they are charging um, fees per day um, without any kind of, uh, and also getting the funding specifically from the city, so they're both, they're being charged up, people are being charged to enter the programs, but they're also, um, the programs are being supported by the city of itself. Um, my colleagues have also touched on the surcharges, and I know this is not an area where the council can really intervene. This is really a state issue, but it is another challenge where the state is really uh, vocal about the fact that they have been using this money as a source of revenue. Um, when the, the city's not being funded by the state, 
uh, the courts aren't being funded appropriately by the state, they're increasing the surcharges and making that money from the, the people who are entering those courts, and this is problematic. Um, but I do think an area where the council can um, take this issue up is just determining how how much the defendants are going to have to pay in fines. Like uh, recently, quality of life offenses, uh, a number of them were moved down from misdemeanors uh, to, to become violations, and that is something that uh, we support. It creates pe- keeps people out of the criminal justice system, away from arrest and incarceration, but it keeps them in this uh, loop where they're going to have to keep paying these fines, and the city council does have the space to determine like what those fines should be, and that's something that the drug policy recommends. Um, we enter, you get a specific fine when you come in, but inability to pay the fine, you, that can lead to increase in the amount that you pay. And that's essentially the city charging interest on low-income community members, as opposed to just considering the fact that they're unable to pay and coming up with different forms of restitution, like community service, uh, or fee waivers, or anything else, uh, when there's an indigent client that can't pay that particular fee. And I think the council should consider um, lowering the, the fines overall, um, like that's something that you can do right now um, and not, you know, charging people increased fines because they demonstrate an inability to pay. Um, people shouldn't be charged interest uh, for being poor um, in the criminal courts. Um, another thing that, you know, even in writing this testimony that kept coming up for me is just the lack of data in this area. Um, a couple of my colleagues have hit a, on this issue in BXD. Uh, I don't know demographically who is being hit with these fines. I can figure anecdotally and just how law enforcement um, is practiced in the city is that it's mostly going to be low-income communities of color just that's because the communities are targeted. But the city is not necessarily tracking um, who is paying, how much they're paying. Um, and I think it's mostly problematic when it comes to the diversion programs that you're recommending like, what are the costs of these? Uh, that's something that Drug Policy Alliance would definitely support um, and would be a benefit to the kind of policy that we promote on a city and state level, just knowing the harm. Um, another thing I want to highlight is uh, just the ways that we can work with prosecutors and judges uh, to inform them about the, the impact of these feeds, to get them to work with clients um, to come up with different forms of payment, different forms of restitution. I think this is a, a moment for judicial education, uh, for them to know ways in which they can decrease the harm done to, to these communities. A lot of these things are written in my testimony, and I won't. It's very long and impassioned, uh, so I will spare you. Um, and go to Khalil. Thank you. Thank you. Testing. Good morning. Um, thank you uh, to the city council and, of course, to you, uh, councilman, for uh, giving us opportunity to talk about this very important issue. I, too, will follow the um, lead of my colleagues and say that uh, my written testimony is also full of fervor and, um, and, and, and many other words I probably can't say. Um, but I just wanted to kind of shy, I wanted to move away from that in terms of taking the two and a half, three minutes that I have here today. Just one second. Do you have written testimony? Um, I do, but it's in my bag somewhere. Um, take a, mo- take so, a moment to get it because it's very helpful to me and I make notes and then I ask questions. So, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, go now? Not helpful. I don't have my written testimony on me. My apologies. That's okay. Just you'll get it to us. I will. Okay. Yes. Um, I wanted to just take some time to, uh, as some of my colleagues already have done, is to uh, tell a story about folks that we serve at Fortune and how they're impacted by uh, fines and fees related to criminal legal system involvement. Um, so I work at the Fortune Society. Uh, my name is Khalil Cumberbatch. I'm the Associate Vice President at the Fortune Society. And Fortune is a 50-year-old organization, as you know, uh, Councilman and other folks in the room, uh, that services about 7,000 people annually uh, on a plethora of services, housing, employment, 
um, mental illness, substance abuse, so on and so forth. Um, we uh, have delivered these services over the past 50 years with the understanding that it doesn't take one particular thing for someone to become stabilized when they leave prison and or jail. With that understanding, we also know that there are other systems involved that impede a person's uh, healthy and successful reentry. And so, for example, fines and fees are one of those things. Uh, we have service people who uh, are still struggling decades after they have been convicted, after they've served substantial amount of times in prison, uh, and still have not been able to successfully pay off restitution fees, uh, other fines and fees associated with their criminal conviction, and then when they are reentering, are expected to uh, uh, find a job and then use the income that they have from that job to not only survive in a very expensive city, but to also pay off these fines and fees and restitutions. And we're not even including other things like back child support, so on and so forth. So one of the stories that I would love to tell you today is of an individual uh, that we s service at Fortune Society who um, was assigned a, a restitution fee and other fines and fees associated with his criminal conviction, uh, didn't uh, have much family during, uh, uh, didn't have much family support during his incarceration. Uh, and so as it goes with most people that don't have uh, family support, uh, the money that they, what little money they earn while incarcerated from being involved in programs or working, uh, they use that money to uh, buy commissary and other items related, you know, in, uh, in the commissary, food, cosmetics, so on and so forth. Um, however, when you have a mandatory surcharge, you have fines and fees and restitutions associated with your criminal conviction, uh, the money that comes into your account, uh, there's a certain percentage that is, that is automatically withdrawn. And so if you're trying to pay off a restitution fee in and of itself that is in the tens of thousands of dollars before you even address uh, surcharges and other fees that are associated with the criminal conviction, you can already see that it's almost insurmountable. This individual came home about three years ago. We were able to uh, help him stabilize by finding some employment. Housing was not an issue for him. Um, on top of the restitution and fines and fees that he has that he's trying to pay off, um, he also is required to pay a uh, uh, community supervision fee. He is on parole, and there is a monthly fee that parole charges you to be on supervision. Um, that fee is five, fifteen, or thirty dollar increments. If you are working, you're expected to pay the maximum amount, which is thirty dollars. And although $30 may seem to many folks as a very affordable amount, again, when you have thousands of dollars of debt related to criminal justice involvement, it's very difficult. This individual was unable to make his monthly payments of $30 a month. Uh, he then had a uh, unfortunate death in the family, um, and he applied, he went to his parole officer and told uh, this person that he had a death in the family in a different state in the U.S. and needed to travel. Uh, one of the first questions uh, that a supervisor in parole will ask the parole officer when they up, when they ask for someone to travel is, has this person been paying their supervision fee? The answer for this individual was no. Uh, and who knows what explanation was given on why the individual was not able to pay the supervision fee. But in the end, this person's uh, travel pass was denied. Uh, removing the fact that this individual was uh, uh, deeply hurt about this family member dying, having to couple the, uh, the experience of that and being denied something as simple as being able to just see the person, their body for the last time, you can imagine the experiences and the perception of community supervision, court systems in general, legal system overall, on how quote unquote fair it is. This individual uh, has left that experience feeling as if there is a never ending perpetual punishment associated with his criminal conviction. I share this example, obviously understanding that a lot of it is uh, state level and that there are issues that city council can't necessarily address. I also wanna highlight the fact that one of my colleagues mentioned earlier that there is a role that district attorneys can play and the role that prosecutors can play in how they uh, aggressively go after uh, restitutions and other fines and fees. In the end, a judge is responsible for that, but district attorneys and ADAs have a role to play in that. 
I think overall what we're talking about is uh, uh, monetary on surface level. But as some of my colleagues have mentioned, what we're really talking about is this perception that we somehow have to continually punish people and monetary and doing it monetarily is one of the ways that that is achieved. So I share this story with you, uh, council member, uh, to one highlight how uh, it is more complex than just a number given to someone because again, $30 is a relatively low amount of money to pay for many people. But when you have tens of thousands of dollars of debt associated uh, with a criminal conviction, it becomes even more difficult for an individual to navigate that process. And that there are other long-term effects uh, that are associated with those fines and fees that are not always measurable by dollar amounts. Here we have an individual who, uh, from my perception, is trying as hard as he can to stable his life, uh, to not go back to prison, and at the same time to lend to his community. Uh, but for something as small as a $30 fee, he was denied something that would have meant a tremendous amount to him to be able to attend a family member's um, funeral. So thank you for listening, and I hope that uh, you know Fortune Society will continue to be looked at as a resource uh, for the city council on how we could work with uh, district attorneys and judges and educating them on the long-term impact that fines and fees have uh, that are associated with criminal convictions on individuals, but more importantly, the impact that they have on their families and the impact that it has on communities. Thank you. Well, let me, <clears throat> let me ask you, and I don't know if you know the answer, but Fortune is a five-borough organization, even though your headquarters is in Queens. Um, what is, can you say what your uh, experience has been with the different district attorney's offices in the boroughs and who have been more or less open to uh, working with people or, or not, who have been less zealous or more zealous in, in, in going after people who own fines or restitution? So I can't, I don't have statistics to spout out about that. Um, I know that as one of the members of the Alternatives to Incarceration and Reentry Coalition, um, the uh, Queens District Attorney has been uh, historically um, very uh, uh, difficult, for the lack of a better term, to work with in terms of uh, not only simply referring people to ATI programs, um, and more particularly, simply referring people to our ATI program, where based in Queens, someone has a criminal charge in Queens, whether they live in Queens or not, that is besides the fact, but most people uh, with charges in Queens reside somewhere in the borough. And so here we are, an organization that is based in that borough, and yet we still have problems with referrals. So I say that to be fair on the record that I don't know what the numbers are in terms of who is more zealous or not. I do know that there are certain district attorneys um, who have found more creative ways to use the money that they have garnered from forfeit assetture and other fines and fees associated with criminal legal involvement. Um, and I think that that example in some respects could be followed by other district attorneys across the city. Um, Okay, um, you know I, I appreciate your your laying out the different fees and and, and surcharges because um, some of the you know seven percent fee to pay credit card at the institution. I remember when the city was doing online bail, we were unhappy with even the two point four nine percent fee. Um, and we'll ask Mark J about what the percentage is on on the the, the commissary programs. Um, the, the, the dollar bail, just for the record, we've got a bill, intro 944, which would require notice, I think within 24 hours, when someone's $1 bail case is triggered, meaning that's, that's the case that's left in the, in the system. Um, and, and then the, the, the figure that you gave, testimony was with bail payments averaging around 2500 that means an additional non-refundable two hundred and thirty-eight dollars might be diverted from 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 uh, from what people could otherwise that 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 money for. Um, math was not always my strong point, but I'm going to say that's probably somewhere that's a few percentage. That's the two point four nine percent and the seven percent. Yeah. Someone wants to pay credit card. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, and then, you know. 
we, we look at um, jurisdictions around the, the country where Ferguson is a, is a spectacular example where the municipal government is more or less funded mm. off the, the backs of, of uh, poor people, mm. mostly black and Latino, and Ferguson probably mostly black. Um, because New York's budget is so large, and the many, many billions of dollars, the 15 million or the 30 million dollars that you cite kind of gets lost in the shuffle, but you know, we're, we're, we're doing similar things. Yeah. Um, do you find, since you're from the Drug Policy Alliance, do you find that the participation in drug treatment programs are particularly onerous? I mean, my understanding is they tend to be more expensive, more intensive, um, and I don't know if you're prepared to talk about it. What role does the availability of insurance or not insurance play in, in people's ability to participate in those programs? I mean, treatment... Um when you talk about treatment in drug courts, it gets complicated. Uh, to start, judges aren't the best determiners of what is effective treatment for a person, um, and sometimes they partner with treatment providers that aren't best suited uh, to provide care for a particular patient. But because they have that relationship between the provider, um, they are not necessarily considering the the medical impact of a lot putting person in a treatment setting that's not beneficial to them either because uh, the type of treatment being afforded. We've come across a lot of judges that are reluctant to put someone in a treatment setting where they're going to be offered methadone or buprenorphine or any kind of medication assisted treatment because of their own biases towards that. And that is a violation of that person's like medical needs. Um, and that is problematic. Um, but then when you talk about the cost of it, if you are uh, if you're insured, if you have Medicaid, um, which is probably better, um, the cost of going into a treatment setting, um, you could probably offset that. But if you're uninsured um, and you're being placed in a treatment setting that one isn't appropriate for you uh, or that is unnecessary, you're responsible for paying the out-of-pocket costs. Um, another challenge uh, when you when it comes to criminal court and so much substance use is the sort of any kind of substance use is considered addiction and problematic, um, and a person who has a, is using recreationally um, can be put in a treatment setting that is not necessarily appropriate for them because the judge determines that they have a drug problem as opposed to just drug use in general. Um, and so now they're paying the, the cost to being in a treatment that is not necessarily uh, best suited for them. And we've had a lot of like anecdotal um, uh, uh, information from different treatment providers saying that they have to keep a person in a treatment setting when they don't have a drug problem. So someone comes in there and their only drug abuse is marijuana, uh, is it interfering in their life in any kind of uh, detrimental way, um, but they have to be in a mandated program, so they're forced to stay in longer than they have to be, um, and then the treatment provider can't necessarily work for them. So you're taking a bed from someone who is could be better suited for it, mm -hmm. um, and then that person has to stay in the program and. Um, hit all these metrics that are determined by the drug court um, in order to get out of the, the proceeding. So it's when it, that particular relationship is fraught for a myriad of reasons, um, not just because of the cost, but also just because judges aren't treatment providers um, and they're giving a lot of space to make decisions about a person's care. All right, thank you very much. It was all very helpful and very informative. And now we'd like to invite up Mock J and, and hopefully get uh, some answers to some, some of the questions that, that have been raised. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Let's get sworn in and get started. 
you swear and affirm the testimony you give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Now, do you have written testimony for us, or, you're or, or any, do you have testimony for us, or just would you answer questions that we No, I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer questions from yeah. council. Okay. Um, so, <coughs> I, I think I would, I would break down the, the, the issues for Mock J into two categories. One is, um, what is Mock J's role, and how does it fulfill that role in uh, choosing uh, these providers of, of, of services who might charge fees and, and the second category would be the information that Mock J has and, and collects regarding the various fees, fines, and, and, and surcharges. So let, let's start with the, the, the first one. W what, is, what is Mock J's role in uh, selecting and, 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 and even contracting with the various programs that are are used in the courts as alternatives to uh, incarceration. So um, I just want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Alana Turco. I'm senior counsel with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Um, as far as our role in choosing programs, um, the there's a series of programs that are um, that run specifically through the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice as ATI or ATD programs that we fund. Um, and the selection process is typically through a procurement. Um, we also, as you're likely aware, run the Diversion and Reentry Council, which brings together many, many, many stakeholders from the criminal justice system, including providers, individuals with lived experience, defense attorneys, um, and prosecutors to um, glean their uh, expertise on all the various providers. Um, so that is our role in terms of selecting providers. So <coughs> about how many providers, uh, when you say selecting providers, uh, how, how many providers does Mock J enter into a, a, a contract, contract with and, and provide city funding in some way, shape, or form to? Sure. So Mock J provides funding to support programs that provide um, alternative to incarceration services. There are 15 ATI programs and five ATD programs in family court, which result in about a dozen providers. In fiscal year 19, there was a total annual award of two and, uh, 21 and a half million um, to cover Mock J's ATI portfolio. And none of those ATI and ATD programs charge people a fee. None of them. None of those programs charge a fee. However, our office does fund one program, um, the Batterers Intervention Program, which the current uh, contracted provider is QCC PAC, that is not included in our ATD and ATI contract, but in a sense serves as an ATI as judges use the program as an option at sentencing rather than jail. Um, and this, this one program does, in fact, charge a fee. And you, you, you said family court. Are, you, do you, are these only programs in family court? I didn't understand where, you, where you, you had mentioned family court. It's just not clear to me. Sure. So there's uh, 15 ATI programs and right. additionally five ATD programs in family court. Got it. So there are 15 ATI programs in the criminal courts, mm -hmm. non-family court, right? Mm -hmm. And five ATD in family court. That's my understanding, yes. Right. Okay. And and those 20 programs in total are, are provided by 12 different providers? Yes. Right. And only one of those programs charges a, a fee? There's an additional program that's not considered within that portfolio that does charge a fee, and that's the QCC PAC <coughs> program. That's an abusive partner intervention program for intimate partner violence. Got it. So all of these other programs that you've heard people testify about where fees are charged, mm -hmm. uh, they are not in any kind of contractual relationship with the city, that, correct? They're not um, in a contract through Mock J. Do you know if they're in a contract through other, some other city agency and they're getting funding from some other city agency? I don't have those specifics in front of me, okay. no. Would you be able... so? From this hearing, there's a number of things that we would like Mock J to give us more information on, right? So, one of those would, since you're the 
Office of Criminal Justice and charged with coordinating, I guess, the administration's policies on criminal justice issues. Um, it would be very helpful if you could figure out for us which programs are present in criminal court and family court that are getting funded by the city and which of those programs charge fees and whether or not those programs have sliding scales or somehow their fees are based on what people uh, can pay. Certainly happy to take that back to the office for further discussion. I think this is a really important question. Um, I should note that there are programs that um, are not within Mock J's purview, so we're happy to look into the issue because we, we think this is a really important right. area as well. Right. Yeah, and, and I guess we're, we're – my next question would be, I, it sounds like there are programs that are brought into the criminal justice system that the city has no involvement with. The, the DA decides this is a good program or the court decides a program. Um, does, does, is Mock J made aware of all the programs that exist in the five boroughs and which obviously some are funded by the city through Mock J. It sounds like some are funded by the city through, through other contracting agencies. And then there's this universe of programs that, that have nothing to do with, with the city. Um, do you know if Mock J maintains any kind of list or, or record of all these various programs? Because they obviously play a very important role in the criminal justice system here in the city. Absolutely. Um, the, whether we maintain a list, I, I couldn't speak to. Um, I think, again, it's an important question. Um, and there are a lot of different venues <coughs> through which the, the larger discussion and questions can be addressed. The Diversion and Reentry Council, I think one of the um, previous witnesses was discussing um, council of all these diversion providers as well. So, yes, absolutely, that's an important right. Well, well question. we would we would ask you, and you know, we'll reduce this to a letter, but, but we look to you to figure out what's going on in the criminal justice system. And when you have figured that, but that out, by the way, please let us know. And I, um, I think it's important to also um, distinguish that the courts, at their discretion, are ordering um, defendants into programs all, all the time. Um, and those are pleas that are negotiated sometimes between defense attorneys and prosecutors. And sometimes it's after conviction, it's simply at the discretion of the judge. Um, so I think it's a little bit of a moving target um, to be totally fair. Mm -hmm. um, so just want to make that distinction. Yeah, no, I, I understand it. And I think that, I think most people would be surprised at, at what of, I don't want to be too critical, what a, what a kind of ad hoc hodgepodge uh, system there is of providing programs and alternatives to people and and possibly no there's no one place where you can go to understand all of the programs that are being made available let alone their effectiveness and for the purposes of this hearing their their fees and costs and I'm, so, I'm very pleased to be here to testify about the programs that mock J um, funds and runs right. through our office I understand uh, just so you know, I think we have an interest, or at least I, I have an interest, in, in imposing on Mock J the responsibility, and I don't know if we can talk about that just voluntarily or Bill, <clears throat> of being um, imposing the responsibility of seeing and understanding and, and, and knowing and then being able to share uh, all the programs that are going on in city courts affecting affecting city residents. Um, the one program that you, you know that does charge a fee, the um, batter intervention program, what, what are the fees for that? Do you know? So there's, <coughs> I want to make sure I'm 100% accurate. There's an initial intake fee of $30. And um, each group session is then $25. The program does um, make available a sliding scale and, in some instances, a uh, um, scholarship. So is it built into the contract with the program that there'll be this sliding scale and what the, 
what the metrics are for that and and who might be so slid down the scale that they can't pay anything at, at all and it, is that in the in the in the market contract? yes yeah. the contract does contain a provision concerning the sliding scale um, and at the bottom end of the income range it leaves open to um, the program at their discretion to determine, the, 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 I should say, at the lowest r end of the range of income, which is $23,500, the um, fee is $5 per session. Um, and below that threshold um, income level, um, it, it's determined on an indi individual basis. So, you know, I assume we have these better intervention programs because we think that they're successful and productive. And I know there's actually a lot of debate on, on that. But, but we have the program, so it's, we have to start from the principle that, that we think that they're worthwhile. And as a practical matter, I think my understanding is in circumstances people are choosing that over some alternative sentence which, would, which they would rather not have to do. Is it fair that, that people who are extremely poor, below that 23,000 or whatever that, that, that limit is, that they might not be able to participate in this program that benefits them and by extension their families and society uh, because they can't afford it? And why don't we, as a condition of the uh, contract with, with the provider, say anyone below this threshold you just have to you have to treat them and and maybe we have to pay more in our contract but but at least people aren't being excluded from a program because they're too poor right I think that's a incredibly valuable uh, important point I um, want to also uh, bring your attention to sort of a new step we're taking with this program first to your first point um, I do think it's worthwhile to highlight the availability of a full scholarship in, um, in some instances um, for indigent defendants. Um, similarly, I think um, our work in this area is um, quite progressive in the sense that we recognize that we want to con constantly be rethinking these approaches um, and how effective our programming is. Um, and to that end, we're currently working on the procurement and contracting process to develop a new trauma-informed abusive partner intervention um, curriculum and implementation plan that potentially moves away from an accountability monitoring type of model, which is the current curriculum, um, to one that centers on as I said, tra a trauma-informed approach and attitudinal and behavior change. Um, and the work may result in recommendations for this trauma-informed curriculum to be offered free of charge if funding and program objectives permit. Um, a question arose in the, the testimony about what is the, the percentage, what is the cut of the uh, for, for cash transfers to commissary accounts. It was suggested it might be as high as 20%. Do you know what that is? I don't. I'm happy to take that back to um, the office to get more details, but that was not within um, the scope of the hearing as we understood it when we were preparing. Okay. Well, you, we'll add that to the list of if you could find that sure. out for us. Great. Um, it, it's, it's also been testimony, and, and I think it was a controller's report, um, about millions of dollars in uh, fees and uh, fines, et cetera, coming into the city's coffers. Does, does, does Mock J have a breakdown on some annual basis of all the, the revenue that is generated from fees and fines and other costs associated with the criminal justice system? Now, so now we're moving into the the, the, we're moving right away from the programs and, and into the, the information collection part of um, what I'm interested in, what Mock J does and, and maybe could do. Sure. Um, I think that all the questions about the mandatory fees and fines that are um, lodged within the courts are, it's a really important question. and. Again, we share concern over it, um, but those court fees and surcharges that are assessed um, are collected by the state. Um, like I said, we are very interested in this topic as well, but I don't think 
we have any of the data necessarily available, and that might be something that um, the state would have available. Mm-hmm. Well, I know that um, Mark J and its role as uh, coordinating the mayor's criminal justice policy interacts with state actors on a regular basis, whether it's the courts or the district attorneys who are kind of have an in-between status. Um, does Mock J think that it's important to understand uh, the <clears throat> costs that are being uh, imposed on defendants in the criminal justice system in the five boroughs and looking at what that impact might be on, on them and the criminal justice system and maybe just as Mock J is convened and, and doing task forces task forces on um, speedy trial issues or bail reform, maybe the cost of justice might be an issue. So um, does, do you know if Mock J has any objection to attempting to collect this data and being able to have a picture of how much is being collected in, in the city, even if some of those things are being collected by, by the state? I think Mache is always interested in what um, insights data can provide um, to our work. But as you know, our director has testified at previous budget hearings, um, including as recently as, as May of this year, um, in, in great detail regarding the funding that flows through our office. Um, and what I'm here to testify about today is the scope that we were provided, which was the ATI and ATD programs that Mock J funds. Do, do you um, have an opinion whether or not um, the city should be imposing the $30 a month probation supervision fee for, for DWI cases? It seems like we we want to get away from adding burdens to people because of their poverty in the criminal justice system in many spheres, whether it relates to bail or, or what it means to be stuck on Rikers Island and not being able to go to work, et cetera. Um, why are we charging people $30 to participate in a DWI program? So I, with great interest, have also been listening to this testimony, and I'm definitely going to take that concern back to our office. Um, unfortunately, it's not something that I understood to be within the scope of today, um, but I do think it's important for us to discuss with, discuss with the Department of Probation. Okay. Look who's here. Um, uh, joined by Council Member Keith Powers, who uh, also chairs the uh, Committee on Criminal Justice. Do you have any questions? Fire away. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for hosting this hearing. And um, I've, I was at another hearing on lead, so I apologize for, for coming late. I think some ground was covered here, but then I've, I've heard the so far the answer so I but so I may I may be uh, expecting what the answer might be but um, I think you asked a question about bail and the cost of uh, of of um, fees on related to bail and paying bail through a credit card so I just wanted to we've been looking at that issue as well we've been thinking about that issue as well since so come up I, I know maybe it came up already in a question but I just wanted to ask so I could hear it um, is there a position from the administration on whether uh, there should be some relief provided to either all or or a certain population around paying fees for credit card posting bail through a credit card um, I know that this is an issue that our our office also believes is important to discuss I don't know of any specific position that has been taken at this point would you know when credit card bail was put into place um, I don't know are you, are you referring to online bail or? Uh, well, online bail was put into this year, right? And then, and so that's new. And then you've been able to pay with a credit card, I presume, for some period of time. But 
I, I don't know. Okay. So sure. so online is new, and what's the fee for paying online? If you use what what is the fee for paying bail online? I believe that was covered by um, previous testimony. I don't have that information available, but I'm happy to report back. Okay. So and then I, what? The prior testimony was two two point seven percent or something. Well, like two point four nine percent for online, and if you show up at a facility, it's seven percent to pay with a credit card. Okay. So if I pay online. I'm using my credit card, I pay 2.7. If I go to the facility, I pay 7% on top of what the bail, 7% of the bail, I pay in a fee. The, what, can you explain the differences, why you're paying seven and why you're paying 2.7 in the two different places? Again, I, I think that um, what I'm prepared to talk about today was about the, the costs associated with the ATIs and the ATDs that MockJ runs through our office. So um, I don't have, that answer available right now. Is anybody, el is anybody else here from the city that does ha have answers to those questions? We, we would have to take it back to discuss with other folks internally. Okay. Um, are you prepared to talk about commissary? Um, and fees related to commissary? Depends on the question. <laughs> uh, the, I think this has been, a, a, I think, a, a topic covered as well, but fees on commissary, there's a bill before the city council now about, um, well, so part of it, some of it's about fees, but also about returning money to people who have money in the commissary. I was wondering if there was a position for the administration on that bill. I, we we don't have a position on the bill at this time. No position. Okay, and um, uh, and perhaps a, a topic for a hearing in the future. Um, uh, and uh, the other, we, I think you covered some of the other topics. So I won't. I won't. It sounds like we need to do a follow up with uh, with Mock J around this, but I think I wanted to thank the the chair for doing the hearing because I think we've heard from a lot of folks about extra costs related to incarceration. Obviously, one concern is it's 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 preventing people from getting out of jail uh, when they have to pay more money than is already uh, put up for the bail. Of course, bail on its own is a is an issue. Uh, that we we care about and, and and reducing the use of bail, but but uh, cash bail, but the but also the fees that then add up and 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 could lead to worse outcomes because of that. Um, I, I guess we'll do. If I, I may have more questions in the future, but um, but I would love to talk to you guys about the, the the online bail and the credit card payment of bail as an extra cost. And I think there's an interest on uh, I think probably with the chair as well about removing those costs from from your folks. Sure. So, Thank you. I have one last question, just to clarify. The, 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 the programs that are, that are free of charge, do any of them require uh, that the uh, person participating have insurance? There are five um, of the programs that do provide uh, clinical treatment mm -hmm. and will uh, bill insurance or work with folks um, on enrollment in insurance, but nobody will be turned away for inability to pay. So if you, you don't have insurance and for whatever reason you cannot get insurance, you can still participate. There's no fee. Right. Okay, good. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll follow up with some stuff. Thank you. All right. Our last panel um, is uh, the Corrections Accountability Project. Um, uh, Raz O'Meal Morgan and from Calm Love Unity, if I'm reading that right. And I'm sorry, I can't read the handwriting, but I think it's Tawate Komutsu. I'm sorry, I just can't read the, the handwriting. Let's get sworn in. If you could raise your right hand. 
Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. 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 Terrific. Thank you. Um, why don't we go from left to right? Please introduce yourself and deliver your testimony. Yes. Blessed love and give thanks to you, council member. I am Ras O'Meal Morgan, and I am with Come Love Unity. It's an unincorporated uh, association that we have started through Medgar Evers College to celebrate and commemorate the ending of slavery in the United States of America. I am here to testify and to um, actually seek support of the City of New York Resolution 181 through the Honorable Jamani Williams and Mr. Cabrera, if I'm saying it correctly. That resolution was proposed to address this. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. The 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution has a clause that is tied to the cost of to what the topic of today addresses by the city council. And to know that the city, in terms of addressing criminal justice, has not really looked at the root cause in terms of 1619 to today's date, which we're looking at 400 years of slavery in 2019, and the fact that seven years after the start of slavery, the city of New York was incorporated. So in being a victim to the criminal justice process, I feel as a current pro se litigant in the Eastern Federal District Courts that the cost to the city becomes more in terms of the injustice that persons that look like myself and others have experienced. So the overall cost becomes more to us as taxpayers because now more litigation is going to happen as to the civil matters for the false arrest, for the false imprisonment, for the kidnapping, and for, for the basic enforcement of slavery vis-a-vis -vis the 13th Amendment. So I feel the council did something trem tremendous or brave in even proposing um, an amendment to the United States Constitution 13th Amendment. That said, we feel the city of New York should look into the day that slavery should have ended, December 6, 1865, should be a national holiday throughout the United States. But before it reached the United States, we need to start it right here in the five boroughs in New York City. So we are inviting the city of New York, the mayor of New York, and all well-wishers to come to Medgar Evers College on December 6, because we, we could start the healing. Because if we're not addressing the root cause, we're going to kick this ball down the, the road for another generation to continue the process that is being discussed here today. So I am here of one who has gone through the criminal justice process. I am promoting pro se in my community, and our organization is around bringing the community information that they can use to help to defend themselves, not just to take an ACD, as I had no clue what that was, or just, just the whole plea process that eventually impact a lot of immigrants who are not able to travel outside of the United States because they'll take a plea for like a penal code 22105 marijuana possession, which now is being discussed to be decriminalized completely in, the, in New York State and the United States. So the city has a work to do to correct a lot of the abuse that has gone through and I feel the discussion is right that the, the chair has started here today. And it needs to continue amongst the other committees, specifically what the Honorable Germani Williams has proposed. And I would love to see that Resolution 181 pass the City Council. Give thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Um, you have to, uh, sorry. Here you go. Good morning. Um, I recently read that you're going to be running to become the next Queen's uh, DA. So the question is, um, I was recently in the Bronx uh, Criminal Court, 
And that was only after I got a letter from the IAB essentially exonerating me of charges that were frivolously filed against me last December. So the question is, I had a conversation with the Bronx DA um, apprising her of the fact that I had that letter from the I IAB to essentially ask her, well, if IAB is exonerating me, why do I still have to come to this um, Bronx criminal proce proceeding? And this hearing today is about cost, the cost of justice, right? So if you could save taxpayer cash, um, the, uh, why not do so? The other thing is, in that particular case, I was appointed two uh, defense counsels. Both of them refused to follow up with me. I sent emails to those defense counsels, didn't get a reply back within three weeks. So if you're funding, I guess, public defenders and people who are seeking adequate representation are having absolutely no follow-up uh, by their counsel, how many times do, that, do they have to actually fire their counsel to get decent representation? Um, also, I got a copy of NYPD reports in regards to that case. Um, essentially, the basis for that case, I was walking from my apartment to a drugstore. I was illegally stopped, seized, assaulted, and arrested. Um, in a public area. They fraudulently claimed that I was trespassing when I was not. So they dropped the trespass charge. Um, I then, you also proposed legislation in, in, sorry, in regards to body cameras. They were wearing body cameras. So that happened last December. I've been looking to get that body camera footage since then. There's been nothing done in that regard. So if the body camera footage itself exonerates me, how much longer do I have to wait to get that body camera footage to, I guess, present it to you during a hearing like this? And um, last point is, in he was talking about the Eastern District. Jack Weinstein, he's a federal judge in the Eastern District. There was a case with Cordero where he wanted to find out how often do police officers lie. So my case is essentially one about credibility. They're making claims out of trespassing. They dropped the charge. They essentially claimed that I was stalking them. Not true. I was asking for their badge numbers, and they wouldn't give it to me to make a complaint to the CCRB. So the point is, how many more times do I have to keep coming to your hearings for, I guess, you to go home, think about things, and then propose appropriate legislation so that people like me, people like him, everybody who comes to your hearings don't have to show up and testify to you? Sir? Hello. Um, hello. Um, my name. You can move it closer. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. My name is Robert Brody, and um, I'm, I'm here to um, speak on behalf of the correction of accountability project. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm kind of hoarse. And um, first, I, I want to thank the council for allowing me the opportunity to speak today on behalf of um, how I feel about the course of justice, like what it means to me, basically. Right? Um, I am one, unlike a lot of other colleagues that was up here, I was formerly incarcerated as well. I was just released last year in November. Right? And throughout my whole incarceration, right, everything cost me when I went in all the way up to now. At this present time, I'm homeless. I'm living in a shelter, right? And I got to pay $30 just to be out. And sometimes I don't have it. And I have to go to my parents. My, my mother had to pay the $30 for me. And sometimes my brother had to lend me the money to pay the $30 because it was a surcharge that was imposed upon me. It was mandatory. And I had to sign it. Um, a piece of paper stating that if I didn't sign it, I would never be released. So I had to sign it in order to get out, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not complaining because I, I want to get out, right? And I'm doing good so far, right? And I'm going to continue doing good as well, right? And um, I don't want to be redundant because a lot of people have spoke about a lot of things as far as surcharges and common savings is concerned, right? And it's kind of odd because we work for six dollars in there, for, for like every two weeks we get paid six dollars, and the cost of commissary, right? The prices is way more than six dollars. The things you you got to eat, and the money that the parents send you, it's not worth it as far as the commissary is concerned. All they got basically is junk food, junk food, and um, a lot of um, heart attack food because a lot of, a lot of people be coming home and catching heart attacks, you know. And another another thing that they're quick chill. I'm questioning if you're familiar with the quick chill. It's the meal that they serve you. It comes in a big plastic bag. It, it goes inside a big um, canister. And they feed people like that. That's how they feed you. And we all know anytime you put enough heat on something, right, um, the plastic is going to get into the food. And this is what they're eating up in there. 
you know, and some people that are not fortunate to have no money, send them no money to um, um, support their needs and their little bit, they, they forced to eat that, you know, and this is why a lot of medical bills not in, in, in prison is going up higher and higher. People's cancer, a lot of people didn't die from cancer, and it's a known fact, right? And um, I also want to speak on, um, like, the parole supervision, right? Um, now they call it JPEG, right? And um, we have to send the money to Florida. And, I, and I'm trying to figure out if we in New York, why do we have to send the money to Florida if, if um, we in New York? The money, if anything, we got to pay for it should be generating in, 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 in um, New York to help us the best way they can. And that's one of my questions. Why is it going to Florida? And, and, and if we in New York have to pay thirty dollars a month, and a lot of people that um, be on parole for like for, for three years, that they attend that they one thousand and um, eighty dollars, they got to pay within the three years, and all that could be helpful for people over here in, in the United States, in New York, but it's, but it's going somewhere else. I don't know why. I'm just curious about that part right there. What like you know. We are too. <laughs> yeah, because you know, and if I'm asking the question, but maybe somebody can help. But maybe we can, we can look into that, you know, because um, you know, and um, I want to speak on um, it's kind of hard as far as um, prisoners coming home and and try to readjust back into society. For me, for instance, and I I gotta say I'm somewhat kind of fortunate because. I have family that you know helps me out, but what about the people that don't have no family, you know? And they have to keep on paying, 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 paying for somewhat. Here, there, I'm trying to get my life together, but yet, you no, know, it's prevent me from getting my life together because I'm still paying thirty dollars, but I don't have, I don't have it, you know. And it's like a lot of suits like I got on right now. I got that from the, from one of the places that they give you free suits, you know. And I'm glad they got programs like that because it helps me out, you know. But um. A lot of people are not really, how can I say, um, fortunate, you know, and um, like I said, I'm still out there trying to find me some work, you know. I'm adjusting pretty well, I, I, I must say so, you know, you know. I'm, I, I just like to give you the opportunity, I say thank you for giving the opportunity to share with a little experience I didn't have, because like I said, you know, mm -hmm. I ain't want to sign me done, because everybody spoke about a lot of things with the surcharges and the restitution and everything, but so I don't want to sign me done and the board of everybody have been here. <laughs> but I appreciate you giving the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Commissioner of Ability Project. Thank you very much. Good. Well, well um, thank you very much for, for coming in and sharing your personal experience. you yeah. got to get some, some tea with... Honey, that's my recommendation. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take your advice on that. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Um, that concludes our hearing. Thank you all very much.